This is the University of Otago. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. For people who don't know, my name's Peter Joyce, and I'm Dean, University of Otago, Christchurch. And it's my pleasure to chair this series of public lectures. We're doing a series of seven this year, uh, each Wednesday evening. This year, all seven of the public lectures are also inaugural professorial lectures. And the universities have traditions that when people are appointed as professors or promoted, that they should do a lecture outlining some of the reason why the university thinks they're outstanding people. So tonight, uh, the talk is from Professor Gary Hooper. Now, Gary Hooper and I were, in fact, in the same class at medical school at the University of Otago many years ago, and I'm sure it was Gary's presence as number eight in our scrum as to why our class won the inter-class rugby competition a number of years in a row. After completing his medicine, he trained as an orthopaedic surgeon, and he's in fact been, when I look at the calendar, on our staff since 1987. Now that really means for many years he was employed by the DHB and we paid him virtually nothing or nothing, and he still taught some of the students uh, that are involved with us in Christchurch. But when Alistair Rothwell uh, retired about six to seven years ago, uh, Gary was appointed as an associate professor and head of the Department of Orthopaedics to take over from Alistair. Now, over his first five years as a full-time joint clinical member of our staff, Gary's done an outstanding job, um, and orthopaedics became uh, one of the most popular teaching runs in the fifth year of the medical course, and he's also uh, added new life to the research going on in the Department of Orthopaedics. So the university justly promoted him to professor um, at the end of 2012. Um, before I invite Gary to come up, I would just like to make a comment as a consumer of orthopaedic services over the last uh, six months. So over the last six months, I have had by one of the orthopaedic surgeons trained by Gary, two knee replacements, and over the summer holidays, I did a three-day tramp carrying a pack and haven't needed anti-inflammatories or pain relief since about 10 days post-operative. So I, I think the services provided are sometimes very good, uh, but when I talk to others who have knee replacements, not all stories are the same, but I'm a very happy customer. So with that, Gary, to talk about dim bones. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. <laughs> I've taken a little bit of artistic licence um, and called the talk, uh, Dem Bone, Dem Bone, Dem Aiken Bones. What I hope to do is outline some of the, or showcase some of the things that have happened in the orthopaedic department over the last five years, and hopefully instruct you in some of the direction where we're going within the orthopaedic department. Just as way of introduction, my name is Gary Hooper. I'm a Christchurch-born lad who's back in Christchurch. I've never left, really. My progress into academic orthopaedics uh, was a slow one, as Peter uh, alluded to. But I'm very grateful to my wife, Lee, and my family for supporting me in my career change. Not only am I grateful to my family, I'm extremely grateful to my colleagues. Without my colleagues in the orthopaedic department, this shift in direction would not have been possible. So, Really what we're going to talk about is arthritis, joint replacement, and the future. What is arthritis? Well, arthritis is when the bone becomes rotten. Here's a good bone with a nice gap between the bone surfaces on the medial and lateral side of the knee joint. This is Peter's knee before he had his knee replacement. When the rust was rubbing on the rust, the bone was collapsed, and that caused osteoarthritis. Between the two bone ends is articular cartilage. Articular cartilage is the absorbed surface which protects our bone ends. When we look at articular cartilage through the arthroscope, 
It's nice and smooth. We put a probe in it and it's nice and spongy. This is the absorptive surface that protects your knee and looks like that in the normal patient. Unfortunately, we're all prone to accidents. And if we twist our knee or put an abnormal strain or shear force across it, often we can damage the articular cartilage. Articular cartilage damage like that predisposes to osteoarthritis. Just a little bit of background on articular cartilage. This is a, a histology section of articular cartilage which is labelled for you. Here's the bone here, here's the articular surface here. The most important feature to notice about articular cartilage is there are a few cells through it, but most of it is amorphous background substance. So there's not a lot of activity going in the background. 70% of this articular cartilage is composed of water. Now we all know from our fifth form schooling that if we compress water, it's impossible. We get a plastic container and push on the water at the top, it's going to burst the container before it compresses the water. So it's this non-compressibility um, function of uh, water which allows the articular cartilage to absorb force. So if a force comes down through the articular cartilage, the water dissipates to another area of the articular cartilage. When the force goes away, the water returns. And it's that m motion and that activity which allows the articular cartilage to absorb force. Articular cartilage is made up of a lot of cells, and these large proteoglycans have mucopolysaccharides attached to them called chondroitin sulfate and keratin sulfate. They are two that we can see within uh, articular cartilage. The function of those mucopolysaccharides is that they like water a lot, so they're very waterphilic or hydrophilic and they attract water and attach water to these molecules. And they're the molecules which allow the water to be retained in articular cartilage, and within the articular cartilage we can see these proteoglycans and water surrounded in a scaffold or a framework of collagen which holds those proteoglycans and water molecules within the, uh, within the articular cartilage and allows the structure to exist. Once, those once that, that collagen molecules become damaged or the structure of the scaffold dissipates or is damaged, those water molecules can escape. And that's just a simple view of how articular cartilage develops within the knee. I'm sorry, how arthritis develops within the knee. Osteoarthritis in the 50s and 60s was a major problem for people because there was no real cure for it. Not until this gentleman came along, Sir John Charnley. Sir John Charnley invented the hip replacement and almost overnight he was able to cure people of their osteoarthritic pain. And so John Charnley started with hip replacement in the 60s, we've now progressed through into the next millennia uh, with ongoing develops in the hip replacement surgery. We'll talk a little bit about that as we go on this evening. Hip replacement at the moment within the United States, both hip and knee replacement combined is the most common surgical procedure performed and it is the most cost-effective surgical procedure that we can give to patients. We have an ageing population. We have an epidemic of joint replacement occurring within, the, within developed countries. We have an ageing population which increases the risk of osteoarthritis and increases the need for joint replacement. We have an increasing healthy retired population so we have patients who are 60 and 70 years of age, the, I mean 70 and 80 years of age these days, who want to do what 50 and 60 year olds wanted to do 20 and 30 years ago. So they have an increased requirement, an increased demand, and they have increased expectations. If we look at the figures in the United States, these are projections out to 2030. That's only 16 years away. So these are projections out to 2030. Hip arthroplasty is going to increase by 157%. That's the demand for hip arthroplasty in 16 years. Knee replacement is going to increase by 673%. Along with that comes the necessity to have a revision procedure. Not all hip, not all hip and knee replacements last forever. In fact, we know all of them are going to wear out sooner or later. The longer you have them, then the more likelihood they're going to wear out. So a revision procedure, that is a procedure to replace 
the index procedure replaced the worn out hip replacement is going to increase. And they're going to increase about the same percentage. So you can see that this is going to place an extreme burden on the costs of health services, particularly when you bear in mind that each revision procedure is about four times more expensive than the primary procedure. What about in New Zealand? Do we have the same figures in New Zealand? We are lucky enough to have uh, New Zealand Joint Registry, which, which looks at all the joint indexes, all the joint replacements performed in New Zealand on a database. Alistair Rothwell, who Peter mentioned earlier, was uh, an instigator and in, uh, uh, organising this registry, and he's still um, championing it today. We looked at the New Zealand Joint Registry, and we looked at the New Zealand Census, and with the help of Alex, who's over there, one of the junior registrars, we looked at some of the results of uh, joint replacement surgery in New Zealand and the demand for joint replacement surgery. If we look at this column here, this is the numbers of joint replacements per 100,000 of population, and the bottom axis here, or the y-axis, is the year. Looking at hip replacement, it's increasing. Looking at total knee replacement, it's also increasing. If we look at the age band where it's increasing, we can see that the 70 to 79 year old age group are the group that demand hip and knee replacements the most within our country. We can also see that females require it more commonly than males. Interestingly, if we look at the ethnic data here, this line here is the Pacific Islanders, the increase in requirement for hip replacement or knee replacement in Pacific Islands. That's increasingly, uh, is increasing quite significantly. Difficult to know why that's happening. We presume it's because the Pacific Islanders come to New Zealand to have their hip and knees replaced rather than having it done in the Pacific Islands. But if we look at other areas like the Caucasian line, it's increasing slightly. The Māori, interestingly, has decreased slightly, not a lot, but decreased slightly. Perhaps that's an indication of their access for care, or their, their limitation of access for care. But this is the graph that you need to keep in mind. This is the projections for hip and knee replacement in New Zealand by 2030. So by 2030, knee replacements, which is the red line, is going to cross as the most uh, acute demand or the most highest demand compared to hip replacements by about 2020. And by 2030, the demand is going to triple. The demand for hip replacement is going to almost double. So we can see that by 2030, we have a huge demand of hip and knee replacements that's going to swamp New Zealand. We have to be prepared for that. We have to be able to train surgeons and train doctors to be able to deal with that. The estimation is to deal with this, we need an extra 100 orthopaedic surgeons alone to deal with this problem. Now, having said that, this is a fairly isolated problem. This is hip and knee arthritis. It's not a, but it is a little bit of a window into musculoskeletal problems. So it tells us what's going to happen with our population with all of our musculoskeletal problems as time goes on. So the demand is just going to escalate. The World Health Authority outlines the top disease in the world, or the, the disease that requires the most input, is psychiatric diseases. The second most common disease that requires input is musculoskeletal diseases. So this is a huge problem for our population, uh, for our, um, our government and our, our funding agencies. Knee replacement is going to overtake hip replacement. Why is that? Well, there's better survival for total knee replacements, so there's probably a lower threshold to proceed to the surgery. There is a prevalence of obesity in our society, and our obese are increasing to get larger. There certainly is a direct correlation between osteoarthritis of the knee uh, and obesity, which is not so prevalent in osteoarthritis of the hip. We also have our females living longer, therefore increasing the demand for hip replacement. Uh, for knee replacement, sorry. If, as I mentioned earlier, all joint replacements are going to fail sooner or later. So if we look at the New Zealand Joint Registry and look at the reasons for revision of hip replacements alone, loose cup, loose stem, dislocation, unstable, they're the top three. You just look at the figures there and there, forget about everything else, but they're the top three. So loosening and dislocation are the things that cause the revision procedures as time goes on. So why do we get loosening of our femoral component and our acetabular component? The primary cause of loosening 
is polyethylene wear disease or wear debris within the joint and subsequent reaction of the body to that wear debris. So for example, if we have polyethylene, which wears, and all polyethylene is going to wear with time, then it creates little pieces of polyethylene in the tissues, macrophages come along, clean up those areas of polyethylene within the tissues, they become big and fat and full of polyethylene, then they burst, they release these lysosomal enzymes. Well, they don't really burst, but they do release these lysosomal enzymes. And these lysosomal enzymes eat away at the bone. So that if you've got a well-functioning hip replacement, you can su suddenly see there's a big hole in the bone some 20 years after the hip replacement because of polyethylene wear disease. So that is a major issue with polyethylene and wear of these joint replacements as time goes on. So why does the polyethylene wear? Polyethylene wears because it becomes oxidative. And once you oxidise polyethylene, the ability of the polyethylene to resist wear decreases dramatically. This here is a cartoon of a polyethylene molecule. Polyethylene consists of these ultra-long molecules of polyethylene with very little cross-linking or, or linking between the polyethylene molecules. And because of that, we have these free, so-called free radicals, areas where oxygen can bind to. And once oxygen binds to that, it becomes oxidised, it loses its strength, and it wears more rapidly. So we've developed ways to try and reduce that, uh, that, uh, um, those free radicals and decrease the oxygenation of the, poly of the polyethylene. One way is by increasing the number of bonds between it. So cutting out these uh, free radicals and increasing the number of bonds. A, a mechanism of doing that is by irradiating the polyethylene. So if we irradiate the polyethylene, we can cause cross-linkages across the polyethylene and increase its ability uh, to sustain wear. And this is what it looks like once you've had these, these cross-linkages uh, applied to the polyethylene molecule. So we can reduce the amount of wear by, by, uh, by changing the polyethylene. And what about dislocation? If we can reduce the wear of, if we can reduce the wear of polyethylene, maybe we can make the polyethylene a little bit thinner. Maybe we could put on a bigger head within a hip replacement and decrease the risk of dislocation. A bigger head means a bigger range of motion before the hip will dislocate. Well, a study that we did here, some uh, started about six and a half years ago, was a study looking at cross-linked polyethylene and wear and total hip replacements. This uses this particular type of polyethylene called X3 polyethylene. Part of the problem with cross-linking polyethylene is you make it more brittle, and so it becomes more uh, able to fracture within the hip replacement and so more susceptible to fracture. So there's a fine line between making the polyethylene wear resistant and mechanically unstable and likely to fracture. So we looked at this new generation polyethylene um, and uh, study of the art uh, using a special computer software program which was also developed in New Zealand by an orthopedic surgeon in Wellington, which looks on a computer image at the amount of wear within these two concentric circles. And so we were able to measure how much volumetric wear and how much uh, um, uh, horizontal wear there was within the polyethylene. This was a prospective study of 100 people, all under 65, so all young people are likely to wear their hips more uh, aggressively than older people, undergoing total hip replacement. And we measure them out for one, two, and five years. And this is our wear line. This may be not that dramatic to you, but what it actually shows you is the steady state wear of the polyethylene. All the wear is below one. One is determined as the threshold for wear, or anything above one is bad wear, so this is all good wear below uh, one. So the issue is that these, this study has shown that, it, that X3 polyethylene, and I have to admit this is the first study in the world where we've looked at 36 millimetre heads with uh, X3 polyethylene, uh, showed uh, decreased wear and the wear rate was certainly within this uh, uh, area, which is the safe area. There was no polyethylene fractures, there were no dislocations, and that encouraged us to continue the use of this type of polyethylene in hip replacements. There are alternative bearings, and some of you may be aware of people who have had ceramic on ceramic or metal on metal implants. Now these hard on hard bearings 
are excellent for wear. They decrease the wear rate significantly, particularly ceramic on ceramic bearings. So if we look at the wear rate of ceramic on ceramic, and this uh, is just a diagrammatic form of the wear, you can see that ceramic on ceramic produces the best wear rate. So why wouldn't you use ceramic on ceramic all the time? Likewise, look at metal on metal. Metal on metal gives you good wear rates too. Why wouldn't you use metal on metal? Well, ceramic on ceramic's good. It's the new types of ceramic called the Biolox Forte uh, in toughened and hardened ceramic and probably give uh, uh, good results. The, the um, literature from the companies will tell you that their wear rates are significantly less than metal on polyethylene that we talked about before. But there are issues with ceramic on ceramic implants. And there are two main issues which deter surgeons from using them. The first issue is fracture of the ceramic. The ceramic is an extremely brittle compound and doesn't light abnormal stress across it. It will fracture. The other cause is abnormal noise or squeaking. So let's go through those to start with. Ceramic fracture. Ceramic fracture occurs because of generally speaking, of two problems. One was with a smaller head. If you look at the femoral neck there, here's the head of the implant. You've got to push a femoral neck up into the head of the implant. So if the head is only 28 millimetres in diameter, there's a smaller amount of ceramic and more likely to be fractured by impaction of that Morse taper into the head. For example, if someone falls off a, off a step or jumps down firmly on the ground, they might impact that Morse taper into the head and fracture the femoral head. So femoral head fracture was an issue early on in ceramic on ceramic implants. When we move to bigger um, um, femoral heads, for example, 32 millimetre, 36 millimetre head, the incidence of fracture decreased. So we seem to have that solved. Femoral head fracture didn't seem to be a problem. So we then looked at the other issue, which is the cup. So this is a metal cup, and inside the metal cup is a ceramic liner, so that the ceramic can articulate on the ceramic. Ceramic liners are, are, are very dependent on the positioning of the cup. So if you appreciate this cup, it's a little bit steep compared to where the normal hip should sit. So the cup's a little bit steep, which means that the head loads the top part of the cup a little bit more than it should. And as a result, after wear and tear, this is what happens. So after usage, the ceramic fractures. So the ceramic's extremely brittle and can fracture. And that's what it looks like when it comes out at the time of surgery. So that's one of the reasons why we keep away, or well, some of us keep away from ceramic on ceramic implants. The other problem, though, is a little bit more perturbing. This is the squeaking of ceramic on ceramic implants. So all metal on metal implants will make a noise. And this is the squeaking, which can often occur some months after surgery. Certainly research has suggested that the squeaking is not normal. Ceramic on ceramic implants are very smooth. They move beautifully in your hand when you're looking at them uh, uh, outside the body. They, they, they are very wettable, which means that the lubrication of them is excellent. And so they move smoothly and sweetly, and the wear rate is very low. If that lubrication for some reason becomes abnormal, if the ceramic head becomes a little bit worn or whatever, that stops the lubrication. Once that happens, they develop a noise, and they can develop noise secondary to uh, loss of the, of the surface. Squeaking hips, patients come to me and suggest they should use an oil can to, to, uh, to get rid of the squeak. Lubricate the squeak, they say. Well, it'd be great if it was as easy as that, but it's not as easy as that. To change a hip that's squeaking is a major operation to re change the componentry and to change them to a different componentry that doesn't squeak. For example, this is a patient of mine. This is the very first hip I've had to revise for squeaking. This is a patient who had a hip implanted. She was fine for two years. She came back to see me and said, Doctor, my hip's starting to squeak. And I said, oh, don't worry about it. The literature says it's fine. It'll go away. Just give it time. So she went away and came back a year later and says, it's still squeaking. And I says, well, all the literature says it should go away. And we're in that time, we were investigating them. And we had SRAM Tech, who are the distributors of ceramic, came to New Zealand and talked to us about it. It says, it doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. I says, oh, OK. So it doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. We're the only people. So it must go away. 
She came back two years later and said, Doctor, you've got to do something about this. Get rid of it. She says, I had to go to a funeral the other day. I walked into the funeral. Everyone stood up and turned around to see what the noise was. So these squeaks are actually quite loud sometimes in these patients. And that's the, the issue. When we took a hip out, we can see that the femoral head had an area of abnormal wear on it and the cup also had an area of abnormal wear. I've outlined that a little better on the rim of the cup there. So that's where she was squeaking. When those two areas moved together, she seemed to be squeaking from that area. That's our premise. That's what we suspect. So these squeaking hips made us wonder about why they're squeaking, where they're squeaking from, what's the problem? James Byrne, who works in our department years ago, looked at acoustic uh, emissions and acoustic monitoring of hip replacements. So we've taken up his, his impetus and tried to look at acoustically listening to these hip replacements. So if we thought if we listened to the hip replacement, we'd be able to tell where they're squeaking from. And therefore, maybe if we can convert that to real patients, listen to real patients, see if they're squeaking, and then get in there and do something quickly before there became a major damage with the hip. So this is a study that which we've run in conjunction with the University of Canterbury. We've um, had Jeff Rogers on it, who got a FRCT grant to, to do this as a postdoc, and Tim Woodfield and I have been working with them on this, and a lot of final year university education uh, engineer students have been working on it as well. So these are the rigs that they've set up for us. We've got a robotic rig where we can listen to the hip as it's put through its paces. We've got sensors on it, so acoustic monitors which come off it, that listen to the hip as it's been put through its range of motion to try and ascertain where the hip is squeaking from, where that noise is coming from. We've also developed acoustic monitors or acoustic uh, uh, um, transmitters which can be strapped to the patient. So patients who present to us with a squeaking hip, we get them to be listened to beforehand, have their hip revised, and then listen to the hip on uh, the rig with the robot to see whether we can make some decision about where the squeaking is coming from. This is a typical readout that you might see from a hip replacement. And we're quite confident that this loud signal here is the articulation. That's the noise that's coming from the articulation. Having looked at some of our studies as well, we can see that the noise that comes from the ball on the end of the femoral stem, so the Morse taper where it's attached, sounds like this. So we can see this completely different frequency where the Morse taper um, squeak comes from as to opposed to the articulation squeak. We're hoping that this drives us now along the line of being able to clinically look at patients who may be asymptomatic listen to their hip and make some sort of clinical decision about where the squeak's coming from and whether they need treatment for that. What about metal on metal? Well, you've all read the newspaper. You've all listened to the news. Metal debris is bad news. Metal debris causes kidney, goes to the kidneys, goes to the liver and is present in the urine. Metal ions inhibit macrophages and suppress the inflammatory response. So if you open up a patient who's had a metal on metal implant, their hip looks avascular. You open it up and the hip capsule looks avascular. It's white, it's devoid of any obvious living tissue. Um, biopsies around metal on metal joints certainly show a paucity of cells. Metal on metal implants were um, popularised in the UK with surface replacements, Birmingham surface replacements, being popularised as not really joint replacements, they're just something to hold you over a few years before you need your real joint replacement. But the trouble is these big balls and metal interfaces shed chromium and cobalt ions. And the chromium and cobalt ions are the problem with these implants. There's lots of it in the literature, lots of it in the Food and Drug Administration, and lots of it uh, within uh, our own uh, media as well. What happens when you get an excess of metal ions within the body or within the hip? not so much in the body, it's generally within the hip joint, those metal ions can cause a hypersensitivity reaction. That hypersensitivity reaction causes proliferation of tissue that looks ugly like that. So you get these big black pseudo-tumours, we call them. They're not really tumours, but it's a hypersensitivity reaction to the soft tissue. 
Just recently, our summer studentship in the last uh, uh, Christmas holidays, we had uh, Gabriel, who was working with us in partnership with uh, Marguerite Vissis and uh, Tim Woodfield and myself. She was looking at the investigation, uh, investigating the con contribution of hypoxia inducible factor. Uh, to co cobalt-induced pseudotumor formation. Just want to steal a couple of her slides. I want to show you what she found. So this is a this factor here, HIF, is has been implicated in the production of cells within so-called tumors or increasing cells within tumors. If you have a low oxygen content or a high cobalt level, you will induce HIF1 and HIF1 alpha and HIF1 beta to cause a change within the cells, right? The end result of that change is it's an increased proliferation and survival of the cells to produce a tumor-like membrane within the hip. So we did some studies of this membrane to see whether there was HIF1 present. HIF1 stains brown, and I think for those of you back there looking at the right-hand slides, you can see that there's brown everywhere. So what we found never been found before in the world, all right, this is new stuff, we've found that HIF1 is present in these pseudotumors. Let's say we can give the patient something to get rid of that HIF1 or to suppress that HIF1. Maybe that means that we can stop the presence of pseudotumor, stop the problems associated with metal on metal articulations. Watch this space. There's one other type of articulation that I haven't really talked about and that's ceramic on metal. Ceramic on metal articulations are used uniformly within the aviation industry. Most of the bearing surfaces within those big jet plane engines are ceramic on metal. Ceramic on metal, the engineers love it. It's the best thing since sliced bread. There's no wear associated with it. It's very, very good and very user friendly. That's all very well in a jet engine. What's it like in a human? So we wanted to look at a comparison between ceramic on metal and metal on metal total hip replacements. It had been done once before in South Africa, but it had been an industry-led project and we were doubtful of the results. So we wanted to get an independent view about what was going on with this type of implant. So the potential advantages of ceramic on metal, of course, were that there would be decreased wear rates and less metal ions because there's only one metal surface. We thought there'd be less squeaking and we thought there'd be less component fracture. Certainly you can't get a fracture of the ceramic liner because there ain't any ceramic liner. So we did a randomised controlled trial looking at these. We've, we've got the 12-month results here, but in fact the five-year results are becoming available a little later this year. And the consort diagram shows that we got most of the people enrolled. We only lost three to follow up, which is a pretty good uh, uh, outcome with this type of randomised controlled trial. And what did we find? Well, we found that there was no difference, really, between ceramic on metal and metal on metal cups. We still generate cobalt levels and we still generate chromium levels, albeit at low levels. All right? The threshold for intervention or the threshold for worry is seven in the international literature. So it's well below seven. And certainly, for those of you that got a metal on metal implant or those of you got a ceramic on metal implant, at five years, it looks like it may be plateauing off. But it certainly doesn't look like a metal on metal is any better than a ceramic on metal or vice versa. Their functional results were equal. So the patients were functioning superbly. They had no indication that anything was wrong with their hips. So what about the future? We've talked a little bit about hard-on-hard -hard bearing surfaces. Certainly in the United Kingdom, metal-on-metal -metal implants have now been banned. So no one can put a metal-on-metal -metal implant in, in the United Kingdom, certainly in the public service, NHS. Whether that's revisited with better metallurgy as time goes on, who knows? But I suspect there'll be a very high threshold not to, not to go down that route. We've looked at modification of the polyethylene, and certainly modification of the polyethylene gives us good wear capabilities. So cross-linking our polyethylene, either by irradiating it, or more commonly now by using other uh, modalities, chemical modalities such as vitamin A or vitamin E, to impregnate the polyethylene to clean up those free radicals, may have a large part to play in the future. Certainly our 
where capabilities for ceramic on po uh, cross-linked polyethylene are showing good 20 to 25 year wear rates. And so hips lasting well out past 25, 30 years. Perhaps there's an indication for new surfaces. And there is development in different types of plastics and different types of surfaces, which may become apparent as time goes on. One of the problems we see with revision procedure is loss of bone. This is not a hip replacement, but this is a loss of bone. This is a patient who's a giant, got a giant cell tumour of his distal femur, with a big loss of bone in his distal femur. How can we treat that? Well, we can treat that by filling it up with an implant. We can put a piece of metal in there and fill the hole with an implant. Makes sense. But as I told you earlier, all these implants fail sooner or later. What happens when that fails down the track? And what happens when it wears out? We've been very lucky here in Christchurch because we've got a company which is CE registered and uh, produces custom implants. Been producing custom implants for about 18 years. Right? No one really knows much about that. I was recently highlighted uh, a, an article in the Herald in London where an orthopedic surgeon was being championed because he had replaced half a pelvis with a new customised implant, a new customised pelvis, built a new pelvis, it said. We've been doing that here for 18 years but no one's really highlighted it. So this is a customised implant in a, in, a, in a hip replacement that uh, had bone loss. All of you can appreciate there's some bone loss there. This patient over the course of time has said, here's where a normal hip replacement sits, this one's sitting inside the pelvis. That she's lost half of her acetab, half of the pelvis as this implant is sitting inside the pelvis. There's a huge amount of bone lost in that patient. So what we can do here, we have the technology here in Christchurch to download a CT and with a CT then build an implant around that particular model. That's been available for some time. One of our members of staff of, the, of our department has developed this and so it's been uh, available for some considerable period of time and that's what it looks like when it's implanted. But... Where is the future of revision surgery? We need something which is structurally stable. We have to put something in which is stable the minute it goes in so a patient can weight bear on it. It has to be stable enough so someone can walk on it immediately post-operatively because most of our 70, 80-year-olds who are having revision procedures like this ain't going to be non-weight bearing. They have to have weight across their hip. It's uh, unreasonable to expect them to be non-weight bearing. We need an implant which has got, sorry, we need an implant which has got some sort of osteoconductivity ability. So we'd like an implant to be able to recreate the bone while it's in there. Perhaps we can develop some sort of resorbable metal constructs where we can implant stem cells within the resorbable metal constructs to develop new bone to allow that bone to regenerate within the patient. That would be the optimum. There's certainly been some work done here by Tim Woodfield and his group with magnesium metals and resorbable metals within this type of situation. Maybe in the future we'll see uh, that develop. The other area that we need to look at is developing articulation debris, which is inert. OK, so we started off with the slide earlier on. Back to the future. This is the problem. What can we do for it? Well, we do have mechanisms, we do have strategies to deal with this type of problem now. We can debride it. I'll just go back one slide so you can have another look at it. There are large flakes of articular cartilage which patients complain about mechanical symptoms. It locks, it catches, it causes problems. So as an intimate measure, we can certainly get rid of those large flakes of articular cartilage, make it smoother and give them a little bit of enjoyment for some time. But we still leave a big crater there. There's no potential for that to heal uh, significantly. We can try and create a healing potential by drilling through to the bleeding vessels underneath the bone, and that might recreate some articular cartilage, but it won't be normal articular cartilage. It'll be fibro cartilage. It won't have the same properties of articular cartilage, and it'll wear out rapidly. We can take osteochondral plugs from elsewhere within the knee and plug them into the defect, like that. So-called mosaopasty. Here's a patient that I've 
Done a mosaioplasty on a lateral femoral condyle. You can see the plug of bone and articular cartilage has been implanted, but it leaves a defect. That's the defect from behind the kneecap where the articular cartilage was taken from. We can plug it with the piece of uh, old bone that came from there, but it's never going to be normal. And at a year or two years down the track, doesn't look too bad really. I mean, it looks good. The articular cartilage looked reasonably well preserved, and you can see where the graft has been implanted. But the trouble with these, of course, is we can only do reasonably small defects. We can't do large, major defects. We can look at regenerative technologies. So some of the regenerative technologies around have been autologous chondrocyte transplantation. This involves two operations. So you come and have an operation. We take some of your articular cartilage, send it off to the lab. The lab grows it, puts it back in a little bottle for us. You come back to surgery, have your area exposed again, have a little periosteal flap placed over that, and then the uh, chondrocytes are uh, syringed underneath that periosteal flap. This is what it looks like. This is a defect in the patellofemoral joint. And there's the periosteal flap, and we inject a whole lot of chondrocytes underneath that periosteal flap. Doesn't make a lot of sense though, really, does it? You're expecting those chondrocytes to develop into that beautiful piece of articular cart who we showed you right at the start. There's got to be something more to it than that. You're expecting a lot of nature to develop um, normal articular cartilage when you do that. So there are significant problems with these current repair me methods. One is that they're unreliable. Secondly, they can only deal with relatively small defects, not large defects. I've stolen these slides from Tim. Tim is our uh, senior research fellow who's doing all our work with our uh, regenerative medicine project in our, in our department. And this is essentially the idea of tissue engineering. So tissue engineering to try and redevelop normal articular cartilage. So we have the defect. You saw this picture just earlier. This is this chondral fracture. We then prepare the, the cells within a, within, a scaf uh, within a scaffold. We populate that scaffold. We make a little implant, like so. And we insert that implant into the knee, like so. Sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds like it might work. Sounds pretty good. So one of the issues with bioengineering articular cartilage is that articular cartilage consists of several layers, and it consists of bone on the undersurface. And so to fabricate this type of tissue engineering or this tissue repair model, we need to be able to fabricate um, different layers of the articular cartilage you're wishing to replace. So this is our current concept, is that by using uh, 3D printers with different um, cells at different levels, we can recreate uh, articular cartilage in a more defined and a more reproducible model. We have our first real live great 3D printer arriving uh, next month. Correct, Tim? Next month. So that's um, been funded by the university and we're looking forward to using that with some of our early uh, experience, particularly with, uh, with um, animal models. So we've gone through sort of a bit of a, a, a travel log of what can happen with uh, osteoarthritis the treatment of osteoarthritis, your joint replacement, and a little bit about what the future holds. In my mind, regenerative technologies hold the key to the future, but we're not naive. They are some time away, right? Unfortunately, they're not for you, but they may be for your daughter or your son, okay? But they're a wee way away. So in the meantime, we still have joint replacement. And as our dean has told us, a joint replacement is the best operation in the world. Correct, Peter? So he tells you that this gets rid of your pain. There are a few little problems with joint replacement, I've alluded to them, but most joint replacements last well for 20 odd years. So it's a good holding manoeuvre until we can get regenerative technologies up and running. However, joint replacement surgery is expensive surgery. And you've already seen my figures on the ageing population and we've talked a little bit in the media about the unmet need. So there's a huge number of people out there that need these procedures, 
and that's going to put enormous pressure on health funding. I remind you, this is election year. <laughs> and also, finally, we as a community have got to make some decisions about where we're going. We as a community have got to decide where we're going to spend that money. Are we going to spend that money on 100 hip replacements to help 100 people, or are we going to put in a liver transplant? Those sort of decisions are tough decisions, but they're decisions that are going to have to be made by the community as we go on, because the health dollar pot doesn't get any bigger. It's not, as Tony Ryle tells us, it's not bottomless. And we have to be aware of that for our future uh, um, developments and our future resources for orthopaedics. Thank you. Thank you.